Welcome to the Divorce Survival Guide podcast, where we have open and honest conversations about co-parenting, separation, divorce, and the hardest question of all, should you stay or should you go? I'm Kate Anthony, your Divorce Survival Guide, and I'm here to help you navigate some of the roughest waters you've ever swum in and answer some of your toughest questions. I've been to hell and back, and now it's my mission in life to help you get to the other side of this process with your sanity and your heart intact. Hey everyone, welcome back. So I know I just did a Q&A last week, but because I was sick for so long, I had to keep canceling recordings with guest experts. I'm just being totally transparent here. So I didn't have any podcast episodes sort of in the can waiting to go this week. So I'm better now. I'm uh, almost 100% finally. So I just did this live Q&A or live Ask Me Anything in our Facebook group. And I thought it would be fun to share it here um, because it was such a great, it's just me talking <laughs> the whole time. Um, they're posting the questions in the group and I'm, I'm reading them out loud and it's all anonymous. I'm only using first names. And so uh, it's a great conversation. The questions were really good. So I thought it would be really good to share them here as well. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, I'm ta- I talk a bit about all of my programs in here as well, which is, I think, always important. And, you know, I just want to thank the women who came and showed up to um, this Ask Me Anything, because there were a lot of you, and so many amazing questions were asked, so important. And, you know, at the end of the day, the most important thing is that you guys are doing the work, that you're showing up. If you're listening to this podcast, you are showing up. If you are in my Facebook group and you're asking questions, you are showing up and you are doing the work. Um, And it may feel like a Sisyphean effort a lot of the time, but it does get better. It does get easier. Um, One of the questions that was really beautiful that you know, you'll hear answered in here, but I want to just highlight it was, you know, I just need to know that the kids are going to be okay. And I think that's just, at the end of the day, I think that's all, that's all we all want to (laughs) know, right? Like, I I can assure you, no matter what's going on at the other house, um, or with the other parent, if you are here, and you are showing up, and you are learning, and you are doing the work, and you are talking to experts and you are working on programs and you're, or you're working with a coach or in therapy or whatever, um, listening to podcasts, your kids will be okay. The research shows, this is not just my opinion. Scientific research shows that as long as one parent is doing the work and showing up and, um, not being an abusive motherfucker, even if the other parent is, as long as one parent is a, provides a safe, nurturing place for the kids to land, the kids will be all right. So without further ado, here is my Q&A, Ask Me Anything, that I did live in the group, and I hope you enjoy it. All right, so some of the questions that we have already. I love this question. Uh, This is from Faye. I'm just going to use your first names in case, um, just, you know, just to be. (laughs) <laughs> Faye says, I don't know what should be shared with my soon-to-be ex about my goings and doings with platonic male friends. So far, I lied, and I don't want to do that, but I want some privacy too. I filed August 10th. He moved out two months ago. You don't have to share share shit with him, Faye. You don't have to share jack shit with him unless you want to, but you also don't have to lie about it, right? You you should very well be able to say to, some, to an ex like, oh, you know, I can't take the kids that night because I'm going out. You don't have to say what you're doing. This person, like the reason that you're, that you are getting divorced is that you're separating your lives. So that is a boundary situation. Um, you have got to have, have good boundaries. They're not entitled to know anything about what you're doing. You absolutely can share whatever you want want or don't want. You can be like, hey, I have a date. If you're friends, be like, hey, I have a date tonight and I'm really excited about it. Or fucking not. Whether they're platonic or not, it doesn't matter. This is your life that you have now separated from this person. So you don't owe them anything. You don't have to tell them anything. You know, this is one of the things uh, that I talk about a lot with um, 
right of first refusal that people often um, people are often uh, you know talk about wanting the fight right of first refusal when you know if they're going to get a higher babysitter if they're going to be out for four hours you know I want right of first refusal I want to be the first person that they call to babysit um, the kids or to look after the kids I'm not babysitting they're your kids but the reality is like how much information do you want about what they're doing and their comings and goings? Do you want to know that he has a date and that, you know, he's hiring a babysitter because he's going out with another woman and like, you're the person who's going to watch the kids while he's doing that? Like, really? I, that's information I really didn't want to have. So anyway, I think that that put that sets you up in that position of like, constantly letting each other know what you're doing. And it's just so unnecessary. Um, so Susanna says, how do I deal with the anxiety, heart racing and trembling I'm suddenly going through after just accidentally discovering that my husband, we've been separated for less than a year, has been carrying on with his affair partner all along, even though he said it was over in 2018. I know this is why he wanted to leave slash divorce not long after we uprooted ourselves and moved from one state to another in 2020. Uh, and she adds, and my sleeplessness. I've been waking up at 3.30 ish and I can't fall back asleep. Um, Susanna, I'm so sorry that you're having to deal with this. Um, it, it's what you're dealing with is trauma. You're, you know, it's bad enough to have had the trauma of discovering an affair and then to have it uh, ha compound itself in this way where you're actually uh, having to be faced with the fact that like they lied one time and then they've been lying all this other, all the rest of the time. That, yeah, this is like a really, like, this is a betrayal. The person that you married and you were supposed to spend the rest of your life with and, you know, have kids with and all of these things, right, are, is lied to you to such a degree that they had uh, an ongoing affair and you found that out and that is heartbreaking and traumatizing enough, but to then discover that it has gone on and he's continued to lie to you, um, is really, really, really like it's an, it's another layer of trauma and betrayal. And look, you're separated now. Um, you, you know, like I said, just said before to Faye that, you kind of, it's kind of none of your business, um, what he's doing with his time and who he's with, but you did just find out accidentally and it's in your lap and it's trauma. That's what it is. And so I would say the way to deal with that is first of all, to not make yourself wrong for it. Don't make yourself wrong for the feelings that you're having about it. Cause they're really valid. Um, and they're really real. The next thing I would say is to not engage with him about it. You know, what we want to do sometimes is be like, and you motherfucker and blah, blah, blah. Right. And I don't know how much that helps. I don't think it helps very much. It helps, it helps, hurts, it helps a little bit, <laughs> right. Initially, but then like long-term, not so much. Um, I would say do some work on healing from betrayal. There are a lot of people that do specific work on this. Um, I have two podcast episodes on healing from betrayal, one with Gilza Fort Martinez, who um, I love. I think it's actually Hilsa. Sorry. Uh, I have another one, and I can't remember her name, but, oh, Debbie Silber. Debbie Silber. And she has a book on this, and you really might want to take a look at this book. Uh, she, it's, it's, a really, it's a really interesting book on um, healing um, after betrayals and affairs. I would recommend checking that out. I think there's a lot of journaling to be done. I think there's a lot of probably therapy to be done. Uh, but I would start with Debbie Silber's book and she's on the podcast. So just Google my name and Debbie Silber and it'll, it'll come up somewhere and you can listen to that episode. And then there's links uh, in the show notes to get her book. But I think that first, the first step is acknowledging the fact that this is real. This is a trauma and that your um, anxiety and like whatever, whatever you're perseverating on is real, right? Like it's completely fucking valid that you're waking up at three 30 in the morning, like with your heart exploding and just like heart racing and, and with rage and fury and, you know, and sadness. 
All right, let me move on. Let's see. Oh, yeah, Carla, this is interesting. She, you said, um, I read somewhere the advice, and she thinks it's for me, but I don't think it was not, not specifically this, that if you're not learning something new about yourself, find a new therapist. Um, she says, I'm in the thick of divorce doing discovery. I told my therapist I felt I wasn't learning any lessons, and I wanted help with that. Her response was something to the effect of, it's okay to just survive during this time. It took me months of actively searching and calling around to find her. How do you find a good one? I vibe well with my current therapist, but feel like she's taking my side on things and not challenging me much. You know, Carla, the first thing I'll say is that I think she's right, right? It is okay to just survive during this time. Like if you're in the thick of it, this may not be the perfect time to like learn your lessons and figure out what you did wrong and all of that. Like if you're in the thick of it, it's okay to just be in the thick of it. But I would say that I would first bring to her, especially if you vibe well with her, bring it to her and say, I feel like you're taking my side on things and you're not challenging me. And I kind of want to be challenged a little bit more. That being said, that's not necessarily what therapists, uh, that's not really a therapist mandate. Therapists are not there to necessarily take your side on things. They're not supposed to really challenge you so much. Um, they're not even supposed to diagnose, right? Like it's it's a very, there's sort of a blank slate, right? Onto which there's, you know, you, you see what you're projecting and stuff like that. But a lot of it is on is on you, which is sort of the difference between therapists and coaches. And it sounds to me like you may be looking for some coaching, Um, In which case, I will tell you, I think my program, Grit and Grace, would be really good for you. Um, Grit and Grace is a is this very small community of uh, it's a it's a group coaching program. If you haven't heard me talk about it a million times, um, it's a group coaching program that I launched in September. And it is unbelievable. And the women in there are holding each other. There's so much compassion and love in this group. Um, And then there's me uh, every week challenging you. I've, I've been pairing people up for accountability to, to follow through on some of the challenges, um, that I've been giving people and, and we do that work, that sort of uncovering work as we're going through it. So you may actually be looking for a coach rather, um, than a therapist to be perfectly honest. Okay. So Stephanie, how would you perceive the situation and react if upon telling your husband, you think you should separate, he is amicable but does nothing to try to stop you or save the relationship and becomes even more cold. <laughs> we are cohabitating while I buy a house and he's staying in the family home. Although it's fairly amicable, he has become even more disengaged from the kids and me, and I'm doing everything to manage the house and kids even more than before the split. How do you all cope with the emotional label, labor overload? You know, Stephanie, I think this is a conversation that needs to be had. Um, This is one of those, you guys are going through all sorts of transitions. And as you're transitioning, all sorts of shit is going to come up. And so I actually think the first thing to do, the first line of defense is always communicate direct communication. So to sit him down and say, hey, I understand that this, you know, that that this is, you know, maybe not what you wanted or, or, you know, but you seem really disengaged and it's kind of a bummer to me that you haven't even tried to fight for the relationship. You can say that or not say that. Listen, you know, many don't, they sort of feel like, well, I guess this is what she wants. What can I do? Especially men who have not been proactive in the marriage. They're not going to be proactive in trying to save it. It's so annoying. Um, but it is what it is. And so, but what you can say is, listen, as we move through this transition, I'm assuming that you are going to want um, some custody of the children. So this is a perfect time, especially if you're living together while separated. I actually have a blog post on this um, on my website, kateanthony.com. Click on the blog tab. It's it's one of the m- more recent ones about how to live together separated. And one of the things that you want to do is say, listen, you know, we are going into this co-parenting uh, agreement. And right now you're kind of opting out of parenting. And if you want to have custody, you're going to need to start to show up as a 50% parent, um, or, or whatever, you know, but even if look, even if he has 25% custody, if he wants to share parenting, he has 25% of the time, he's going to have to be on the clock full time, right? So he's going to have to, he can't opt out. 
And so I think I would I would call him on it and say, listen, we need to actually set up um, some structures about how we are uh, living together and co-parenting in the house for the duration um, before we um, before we, you know, physically separate Um, because this isn't working for me. Um, and it feels like you've checked out and now like I'm doing even more work and, and this is not okay. So, you know, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you, you can set a custody schedule, you know, a shared parenting, parenting time schedule within the, within the home and say, listen, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you are on deck for getting the kids, um, ready and up and breakfast cooked and off to school you know, Thursday, Fridays, I'll, I'll do it. And then we can rotate whatever it is. You set up a, you know, a parenting plan inside the house. You can set up financial plans. You can set up household division of labor plans. So really, um, this is a conversation that's really, really important to have, uh, because it's not okay that all the labor falls on you just because he's checked out. Um, so have that conversation. And have it be collaborative. Don't be like, and so you have to do this and you have to do this. You say, listen, this is the problem that I'm experiencing. How can we solve this together moving forward, knowing that this is the kind of collaborative relationship we want to create for our children ongoingly? Because we want to work together as collaborative co-parents. Once we separate, let's figure out how we do that now, starting now uh, within the house. So you know, uh, here's all the labor. What would you like to take on? What will you take ownership of? And have it be a collaborative conversation. But I would start it by saying, the way this is going right now is not working for me. Okay, so uh, Melissa, how do you deal with a verbally abusive ex-husband who is also an alcoholic and an addict? He's the one who wanted a divorce, but he still will text me abusive things. I normally just ignore, is this normal? Uh, Yes, it's normal because abusers abuse. It's perfectly normal. And especially if they are alcoholics or addicts in some way, you know, when they're using and they don't know how to process their emotions, they, you know, they have to get it off of themselves and they, um, by definition, need to put it onto you. And that's, you know, why, you know, what they do uh, when they abuse you. So it is perfectly normal. Ignoring it is a good idea. You can, I would put them on mute um, so that you don't have to be um, bombarded by it. If you have kids, I'm not sure if you have kids. If you don't have kids, fucking block his ass. <laughs> There's nothing to talk about. If if you have children and you're concerned about your children in his care, I want to make sure that you um, have something set up like Soberlink um, or mandatory drug testing. But at the end of the day, abusers abuse. It is perfectly normal. Yes, you should ignore it. And if it continues and you need to um, co-parent, you can uh, put in a request for a co-parenting app. If you if you have enough evidence that he's being really abusive and he's harassing you, you can call an attorney and say, listen, this is the evidence that I have of his um, abuse. Some states, they don't accept screenshots of texts and you have to actually download them all, whatever. But if you show a repeated history of abuse, you can get a restraining order, uh, a digital restraining order, um, and you can mandate the use of a co-parenting app um, instead. So I hope that helps. Caitlin, I know the answer is probably therapy. Uh, But do you have any other suggestions for getting over the guilt of things like not being able to make it work, for having spent so much on a wedding, for not uh, taking the red flags more seriously when they first unveiled themselves sometimes years ago, for things like built up resentment that might have been resolved if you had only set your boundaries and expectations earlier, especially if things aren't horrible in the grand scheme of things, they are just less than what you deserve or would want for your child. You know, guilt is an interesting thing, right? Like, it's so fascinating. It's like, there's all these red flags. Um, there's all these resentments. I don't know. I think sometimes we take on too much, right? Like, is it was it only your job to make this work, right? You didn't make it work. Like, well, I don't think you I don't know that you should feel guilty 
about, I'm not invalidating your feelings, obviously feel guilty, right? But I think we often, I think codependence, codependency work would be a really good idea. My favorite book of all time on codependence, I, I, I say it a million times, is Facing Codependence by Pia Melody because it really deals with the childhood trauma involved and why we become codependent and how, in fact, I happen to have the tree right here. Um, so what, this is the codependency tree. And so what she says is that these are the, this is the, these are the roots, right? Enmesh, enmeshment, neglect, abandonment, abuse, and all of the shame that goes around along, um, with that from childhood, which, you know, manifests itself as the code, uh, the core symptoms of codependence, um, which you can read about in the book or in my program, uh, Tackling Codependence, which is a quick 90 minute uh, workshop that you can buy on my website for $67. I highly recommend it. Um, but then she's saying that all of this, the code core symptoms of codependence lead to all of these things, mood disorders, um, process addictions like food, anorexia, depression, uh, chemical addictions, anxiety disorders, like all of this shit, Right. And so I would take a look at the systemic nature of, of your guilt. Like, why are you taking on uh, the guilt for the whole relationship, right? Um, and how are you holding that when it's really not, it, it may not all be yours, um, but yet you're taking it on. So I think that doing some codependency work would be really useful. Again, um, tackling codependence is all about this. My my sixty seven dollar ninety minute on demand workshop, and um, I think that would be a really good a really good thing for you to look at. Um, and and sure, therapy to to dig more deeply into that. But I would just start with you know this. 90 minute exploration of like, what is this that has me feeling the guilt for the whole relationship? And, you know, and by the way, you know, doing this work is uncovering, oh, wow, what were all the red flags I missed? Also, uh, my program, Should I Stay or Should I Go?, which even if you've already left, is an amazing way. It takes you through um, the relationship, you know, inventory process so that you can look at all the, all the red flags that you missed and why maybe you missed them. And what was your relationship mapping that had you get here in the first place? So should I stay or should I go is a great thing to do, not just before, uh, you've made the decision, but even after the decision, so you can better understand what happened and how you got here and not do it again. Right. That's the that's sort of the biggest promise of should I stay or should I go is that this program will help you not do it again. Amber, is it possible to fall out of love? Fuck yeah. My husband and I have been married 10 years. We have three young kids. For the last year, the physical and emotional connection just isn't there for me. He claims he doesn't feel any disconnect, but I can't keep living this way or I can to not hurt his feelings of moving forward with divorce. But I'm worried if this feeling continues, I'm going to seek out elsewhere. Sure. Do you think therapy will help this? Couples solo, do people ever get that feeling back? Um... Oh, Amber, this is so heartbreaking. I mean, look, people fall out of love all the time. Um, it just, it, it really depends on why, right? Like, and I, I hear something that I find very interesting in the, in the way that you phrase this. He claims that he doesn't feel any disconnect. Because if you feel disconnected and you don't feel in love with him and he doesn't feel that, then he is already disconnected. You see what I mean? He's already disconnected. If if he doesn't feel any any like oh there's nothing there's something different. <laughs> there's something different here in our in our marriage. I don't feel a disconnect. But if you're disconnected and he's not feeling it, then he's checked out. So I would question whether or not uh, this is just a you problem. So in that case, couples therapy might work. Now, there are a few cases in which you ab couples therapy actually absolutely cannot work. Active addiction, if there's any active addiction in the relationship, you cannot go to couples therapy. It is counterindicated. If there is an active affair occurring, you cannot participate in couples therapy. If there's active abuse, you cannot go to couples therapy. Uh, abuse, a couples therapy is a dangerous place to go if you're being abused. And if one of you has a specific agenda, 
Um, that's not about like, yeah, I want to feel more connected to my right. That's an agenda. That's fine. Um, but the agenda being like, I want her to understand uh, that what she's doing is wrong or I want him to um, change. Right. So that's not going to work um, in couples therapy. But I do think that in this case, um, you you know, if 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 none of those things are present, um, there is a there's something going on, I think, with both of you, you know, and whether it's a chicken or egg thing, I don't know. Um, but it is possible. It is possible. It happens all the time. And, you know, if you talk to any people, anyone who's been married for a very long time, they will tell you that their marriages go in and out of connectivity. Right. Um, and that it takes work to bring it back. And so is it worth it? I think absolutely it would be worth it. Um, again, as long as those four things, any of those four things are not um, present. So I hope that helps. Suzanne, my husband is convinced that I'm having an affair. I am not. He thinks that when I go running at five in the morning that I'm meeting said lover. This is the same when I go out with friends or stay late at work. He is 100% a narcissist and is controlling every aspect of my life. I'm making a plan to leave, but for the life of me, I can't figure out what his end game is by accusing me of this. I can tell you exactly what it is. Nine times out of 10, when a narcissist makes an accusation, it's a confession. When a narcissist is accusing you of something, it's usually because that's what they're doing. And because narcissists do have no comprehension of where they end and another begins, because in their world there is no other, that's why he's convinced of it. Now, I'm not saying this 100% because I don't know, but I'm telling you, nine times out of 10, they're convinced that you are doing something because they are doing it. And because they have no sense of there being a division between themselves and another because the whole world is about them, they are 100% convinced that that's what you're doing, that you're doing what they're doing. One of the questions I get asked a lot in my Facebook group, my programs, on Instagram is what do I do with my engagement ring, my wedding ring? I've got all of these beautiful diamonds. I don't know what to do with them. Well, today's sponsor, Worthy, can help you get the most money possible for your jewelry, fast and risk-free. When you partner with Worthy, they do all the work for you and their competitive auctions get you up to three times what a local jeweler would offer in as little as two weeks. The best part about Worthy is that you are in charge of what happens to your jewelry. You set the reserve price, you approve the winning bid, and then you get paid. And if your item doesn't sell for the price that you want, Worthy sends it back to you at no cost, fully insured. And now you can visit worthy.com slash DSG and get an extra $100 when your jewelry sells for over $1,500. That's worthy.com slash DSG. Worthy a better way to cash in on that hidden asset in your jewelry box. Worthy.com slash DSG. Divorce was finalized in May. Now I'm trying to figure out how to navigate life with a 14-year-old son who watched his father treat me horrifically for his entire life. I wanted out of the abusive dynamic, and now I realize that I'm living with it still in the form of my child, 100%. The scenario I helped to create. I shouldn't have let this be um, his model for as long as I did. How do we get through this when I'm feeling constantly triggered and I'm moved to tears and shame because I feel like I created this? First of all, you didn't create this. You did not create this. You are the safe parent. I want you to, Christine Cocciola, Dr. Christine Cocciola, I've had her on the podcast a few times and I just had her on a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about being the safe parent and being the protective parent. She has a program for protective parents and she talks all about this all about what happens when it seems like your children are turning into the abusers. And it's not that they're, that's what they're doing. It is that they had a model. That's not your fault. That was your ex's fault. But there's a reason that they're doing it. And it has nothing to do with them becoming abusers. And, you know, the behavior is really difficult. So um, one of the things that Christine talks about is you becoming um, the therapist for your children. Um, you've got to be the therapist in the house. 
And you've got to be able to say, you know, I know that this, this, you know, the way that you're speaking to me right now, um, I think that, you know what, I don't want to say what you're supposed to say, because I want you to get it from uh, Christine, because I'm, I don't want to get it wrong. Um, because she is the expert on this. And I really want you to you find her on Instagram at coercive control is IPV right? IPV standing for intimate partner violence. So coercive control is IPV. I want you to go and check her out and you can ask her, um, ask her about, uh, you can, you can, you can, um, you can message her on Instagram and she will talk uh, to you about it. Um, so hi, Kate, we're seeing a marriage counselor together and individually. My husband moved out two months ago. The relationship was verbally, emotionally abusive um, towards me. We have a th- we have a three and a half year old daughter together. He wants non contact at all with me. How do I move forward? Should I even continue seeing the therapist if he refuses to communicate outside of the therapist's office? All right, Tina. So first of all, uh, you should not be in marriage counseling with someone that you're already divorcing and who has been abusive. So I want you to um, not, <laughs> not do that. It is also, generally speaking, considered a conflict of interest for a therapist to see you individually and also as a couple, unless the individual work is part of the work uh, that you're doing as a couple. But if they're actually acting as your individual therapist, and then also acting as the couple's therapist, and then also acting as his individual therapist, there's a whole load of conflict in that of itself. If he wants no contact with you um, other than, it's interesting that he doesn't want to communicate with you outside of the therapist's office, but he will communicate with you. So I would, I would shift, I would shift the therapy. Um, I would find your own therapist, first of all, for individual therapy. And I would shift the 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 focus and the client um of the of the couple's work to uh, co-parenting. And just have it be about how you co-parent because it feels like there's just too much shit going on. It's very confusing. He moved out two months ago. He was abusive. You should not be in therapy with an abuser. So, and he doesn't want contact with you. Fucking fabulous. Seriously, if he's an abuser, you win. And you should talk to the to the therapist about being if they're if they are a co-parenting specialist, if they then then if they're not, then find one who is. And if they are, if they do specialize in this, they can help you with this. Also talk about implementing a co-parenting app such as our family wizard or fair so that you can um uh, you know, co-parenting effectively, you know, in the time, time between, uh, your co-parenting sessions, but it, that just feels very messy to me. What was, what you're describing. So, um, Rachel, what is the best way to deal with a soon to be ex who moved out two months ago? I am the one who made the decision to divorce and he is now incredibly emotionally, verbally abusive, including around our two and four year olds. He does not take the kids overnight and only takes the kids when they agree to go with him, then blames me when they choose not to go with him. I just want to know the best way to protect my girls from this. Okay, first of all, two and four-year-olds should absolutely not be put in the position of having to choose when they see a p- one parent or the other. They're way too young for that. It puts way too much pressure on them. It is not an appropriate thing for them to make a decision about. You should, if you should have a co-parenting schedule, period. Um, they're way too young to de- be deciding. You know, the reason in most states, the courts, you know, don't allow children to make these decisions until they're uh, teenagers is because that's, you know, they're not, they're not, emotionally and psychologically developed enough to make that choice. He's he's abusive around your two and four year olds. So look, this is one of those situations where and again, I don't know the specifics. So I'm 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 concerned that they're that they're in the position of making that choice. They should never be in the position of making that choice because then right it opens you up to this abuse for him to be like, you know, you're not facilitating my relationship with my kids or you are protecting them or anything like that. Um 
And so maybe, listen, if you have a set custody schedule, a set parenting time, actual um, shared parenting calendar, then, and you tell the kids like, this is it, you know, and this is not, it's not optional. Um, as long as the children are safe in his care. Now, my concern is that you said that he's becoming, he's now emotionally and verbally abusive. Like, does that mean that he never was before and now he is? Or, and is it around the kids? Or like, if he has the kids on their on his own, is are they safe with him? Are they emotionally and psychologically as well as physically safe with him? Um, unfortunately, the court system really doesn't give a shit. As long as they're physically safe, they're, you know, um, abusers get custody. I can't stand the fact that the courts say that, you know, well, they're not abusing you. Uh, they're not abusing the kids. They're just abusing you because these are not siloed um, events. Um, if they're abusing you, th that is child abuse. So, but unfortunately, the courts don't see it that way. All right. So Ashley, on the other side question, any suggestions for navigating when triggers from an emotionally abusive marriage get activated in a new healthy relationship? Yes. Consciously recognize that the new person is not the old one, but sometimes my trauma will respond before I do. Then my new partner's care slash understanding slash actions remind me otherwise. I know healing is not linear, but it's frustrating to be haunted by trauma when things are going well and I feel indifferent when I actually think about my ex-husband. Oh, honey. Oh, honey. Abso-fucking-lutely. Oh, it's such a thing. It's such, such, such a thing. And I'm glad you, I'm glad you put it this way because one of the things that I, I like to distinguish, right? People say like looking for red flags in a new person and often what they're talking about are their triggers, right? They're like, I, I, I you know, there's this, there's this red flag and I'm like, well, is, is that a red flag or is that just you, you're triggered from your previous relationship? So, um, I'm very happy that you are actually clear that you are being triggered, um, by, uh, from your old relationship. So I think, listen, naming your triggers is the most important thing, right? Of course it takes a minute. Of course it does. And listen, when you're on the other side and you're in like, you know, one of your first new relationships and things are, are, you know, you're in the first couple of years, you're, the triggers are going to be real. And that's one of the things that a new partner is going to have to live with right? They're going to have to um, accept that this is where you are um, or not. Um, but if they're going to be in a relationship with you, this is where you're at. And so I think having the conversation and saying really directly, I, I, I get triggered by X, Y, Z, and it is not your fault. Um, you're not doing anything wrong, but it is, this is one of my triggers. And as long as you're keeping it in I language, I can't deal with this. I am getting triggered. And if you can make a request of them, you can say, this is my trigger. Um, it would really help me if you would X or would not Y. Um, an example is that I have a, I have a very, um, you know, old trigger from my childhood about um, lateness because there were many, many uh, days or weekends when I would be waiting for my dad to come and pick me up for his weekend, um, for my weekend with him and he wouldn't show up. And so I would be waiting and I'd be waiting and I'd be waiting and I was little and he wouldn't come. And so as I got older and was dating, when somebody became, when someone was late for a date, I would freak the fuck out. And for years I would freak the fuck out on them you know, like, how dare you and be disrespectful and da, 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 da. And then it was like, ooh, crazy girl, right? Because my reaction was not right sized. But as I grew and as I began to do, you know, all of this work and I, I was able to say, hey, I have a trigger around lateness. Here's where it comes from in my, in my background. And so when you're late and it, you're like, you don't text me or you don't call and you're like, you know, 15 minutes late for a date or something, I spend those 15 minutes kind of, you know, being triggered and getting into, um, you know, feeling very abandoned because that is, but it's, it's my trigger. Um, and I know it's my trigger and I know you don't mean anything by that, but it would really help if, um, if you're going to be late, if you just shoot me a text or call me and somebody who loves and cares about you, 
will be like, oh my God, of course. But they'll only do that because you kept it in I language, because you said, this is my trigger, right? This is my trigger and this is what I need from you. And unless it's something completely outlandish or that bumps up against one of their triggers, which is very often because that's, you know, we're attracted to people that mirror our, um, our childhood wounding very often, right? It's, it's sort of our, it's our job in relationships to stretch ourselves in order to meet the needs of our partner, right? Like that's, that's what we do. That's our, that's our job. It's our job to do that for them and their job to do it for us. Unless it's something that they're like, I, that's really challenging for me because that feels really controlling. And I have trauma around having this really controlling mom that like, you know, was monitoring every, you know, and whatever, whatever it is, that's, you get into that response, you get into that conversation, right? But again, it's not you, 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 that then you take it from there. You open, this is intimacy. You open up that level of intimacy with your partner and share your trauma and share your triggers. And you sort of hand them to them and say, can you please handle this delicately? And if they love and care about you, they're going to take it and be like, yes, yes, I understand. Um, and if they're not capable of doing that, then you may have an issue. Um, it also might be something that you have to take to therapy. So Ashley, I hope that helps. Natasha, my husband is an addict and has a history of physical and emotional abuse towards me when using. He's been sober almost three years and has made tons of changes in the past year. How can I move past all of the negative stuff? Mm -hmm. I feel like it's piled up so much and I just can't let go, even though he's doing so much right now. Oh, sweetie. Yeah. Let me just say, you know, first of all, sometimes when you have been abused, you can't get it back. You can't, you know, if, if you have been like, let's think about like a dog, right? Let's say let's just not that, you know, that there's a, you know, but think about a dog who has been beaten by an owner and then the owner doesn't beat them anymore. Are they, is that dog really ever going to trust that person? Like, are they, you know, you know, dogs, they flinch, right? I mean, if you've ever ad adopted, um, a, an abused dog from a shelter, the rest of their lives, they're still scared, right? Of, of things that remind them of their abuse. And so you're still in this relationship with this person who abused you. I don't know at what point you trust, um, that it's not going to happen again. I love that he's been sober for three years and I love that he has made a lot of changes. Um, I think it would take, um, possibly some work with somewhere like the marriage recovery center where, you know, I'm hoping that he's moved through the steps that he's actually uh, working, uh, in a program and, um, has made amends and really taken responsibility, like no kidding, a hundred percent responsibility for the abuse. If you still are like, I want this, I want this to work, right? I love him. I really actually like believe in my heart that he will not do this again, then you should probably get into some um, abuse recovery uh, therapy together. Um, but if he is not taking full responsibility, then, you know, um, you, you may not be able to, I wouldn't get it back if he's not taking full responsibility, then, then there's a problem. I want to make sure he's in active recovery because if he's not in active recovery, again, the, the chances of relapse and slipping back um, into um, addiction and therefore then abusive behaviors is very high. So I want to make sure that he is um, he is doing that work and that if you feel safe to go into some abuse recovery therapy with someone somewhere like the marriage recovery center, that might be a very good idea. Um, I don't think you can do that on your own. I really do think you need the um, help of a skilled therapist. You want somebody who is who specializes in um, addiction um, and and a history of abuse. Um, I would interview some people on that because this is a very specific thing uh, that I think you may get a lot of therapists who are like, oh, yeah, I can totally do that. Mm. I want to make sure this person actually uh, has some training around this and specializes in it. 
Okay, here we go. Christine, how do you get away from the feeling that everything that has happened is your fault? Hmm. For years, I would make excuses for him, cover for him, walk on eggshells to keep the peace. He is emotionally, verbally, and financially abusive. I filed in September. He also has a drinking problem. The kids and I have moved into my parents. I still question everything I do. I just started therapy and working on trying, but I'd love to hear your opinion on how to stop feeling at fault for everything. Oh, sweetheart. First of all, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that you're dealing with this. It is so, um, it's so insidious. And the reason that you feel like everything that's happened is your fault is because that's what you were made to believe for however long you were in this relationship. Um, that is what abusers do. That is the gaslighting of abuse because you're constantly made to feel like, ah, you just didn't get it right. Ah, you know, I just need this for, for, for I need this from you. And then I wouldn't, ha- I won't abuse you anymore. I just, you know, if you would just talk to me in this way, if you would just alter your tone of voice this way, if when I come home, you would say this instead of that, then I wouldn't have to abuse you. They don't use that word, right? But then I wouldn't be mad, right? So you're like, okay, 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 I'll do that. I'll do that. And then you do that, but that's not quite right, right? And so you've got this moving target, do, 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 and you cannot ever hit it. You are constantly, you have been told for however long you have been in this relationship that it is your fault. And part of healing from abuse is starting to, to, to shift your perspective to understand that like, oh my God, this is not, like this was not my fault. I tried everything that I could do. I bent myself into, pr- twisted myself into a fucking like crazy pretzel and it still wasn't good enough. So, you know, emotional, verbal and financial abuse, right? If you would just not spend this. If you would just do this, then I'll give you money. If you would just love me the right way, if you were just sexier, if we just had more sex, right? So good God, of course you question everything you do. This is brainwashing. This is like gaslighting is like brainwashing. So of course, so in order, you know, you want my opinion on how to stop feeling at fault for everything. I think one thing you should do Um, And this is in my, um, it's actually in both programs, in the Divorce Survival Program, but in in Should I Stay or Should I Go? I actually think, Christine, you should, um, if you haven't already, um, join Should I Stay or Should I Go? Because even though you're gone, it does all of the personal development work to build your self-esteem and to sort of anchor yourself in yourself. And then it has a very in-depth relationship inventory that's very difficult and very, um, you know, hard to get through. Um, but it's really important and it'll start to give you more objectivity about like what actually happened in your relationship. Um, and I think every, every piece of should I stay or should I go will walk you through, um, your healing process. Um, I know that's counterintuitive because it's called Should I Stay or Should I Go? But again, I say this all the time. This program is is like, it's a healing program. And you can do it before you've made the decision. And you can also do it after. Um, so I, I think that would be a really, really, really good idea for you. Um, and again, it's, you know, the difference between coaching and therapy. Therapy is great. But this program is way more directive and way more like, learn this, do this exercise, do this visualization do this written exercise, which is, I think at this point, maybe like, you know, and then once you sort of get all that, then therapy might be a really good place to bring all of it. Um, the other thing that's amazing about, um, you know, any of my programs, guys, if you've joined any of my programs, the community calls are fucking the bomb. Every month we have a community call and the, the community, um, is amazing. And we do Q and A's like this. Like I answer all your questions, except you're actually on zoom. And so like, we can actually talk to each other. (laughs) Um, so honestly, Christine, I think that's, that is my prescription for you. Leslie, I've come to find the basics, uh, the basis of everything that has gone on with my husband is due to him being emotionally immature and irregulated. 
Yes. <laughs> yes. I've lost so much love for him and fell out of love due to his manipulation, verbal and emotional and physical at times abuse. He seems to be working to turn it around, but the guilt for me is terrible as I can't bring myself back, especially if I think about, about it for the hell I have been put through in the past. Am I not validated to feel this way if he's not doing that now and trying hard to move forward to be better? We haven't slept in the same room or been intimate for seven months and I don't miss it. Oh, Leslie, sweetheart, listen, <laughs> don't you love it? How they're like, they f like, they put you through hell for years and then they're finally like, oh, wait, I see. Okay, let me do work on that. Um, so now everything's better. Well, we are still battered and bruised and, you know, whether that's physically or emotionally, psychologically exhausted and like bent out of shape and we don't know who we are anymore. And we've got, you know, psychological trauma and like, we're just supposed to be okay. No, absolutely not. And listen, you know, part of this is you know, if someone is really changed and like really changed and really doing the work, part of that is going to be them going, I get it if it's too little too late for you. I have so much regret for everything I put you through. And I 100% um, get it that I, that, you know, I wouldn't be able to come back from that. And I'm so sorry. You know, um, that's putting you like your needs and like empathy for you and your experience above what they fucking want. And if they're not able to do that, then I, then, you know, the limitations of their growth and their change. Um, so you are validated. You are a hundred percent validated for feeling this way. Um, and you know, it might, it, listen, it might take time. It's going to take a lot more time than what you're, what you're talking about. So, um, you know, on the one hand, as I always say, um, it, you know, very often too much water has gone under that bridge and you can't get it back, especially if you've been abused. Like, we're not supposed to go back into the lion's den after we've been attacked by the lion. Like, who does that? That's crazy. You know, the lion may be like rolling on its back and like, you know, aren't I cute? But like, really? We're going to go back in there? I don't know. You are you are very validated um, in your experience. And especially if, you know, all of his manipulation, verbal, emotional, and physical abuse, like... Yeah, I don't know. Um, and I and I would also want to know what what specifically he is doing. Um, I want you to go back and listen to um, one of my podcast epi episodes with Annette Altman's, and she's talking about I don't remember which one it is, um, but um, I think it might be. Oh, it's the one about therapy, about couples therapy. Um, going to couples therapy with an abuser. And she uh, talks about what it took for her husband to go through the process. And it was it was three years before she began to trust him again. Um, so we shall, you know, that's those are my that's my, you know, what is he doing specifically? I want you to listen to that podcast episode for sure. Um, OK, Shauna. I hired a divorce attorney and filed for divorce August 3rd. My two teenage daughters and I moved out of the house because CPS got involved due to his abuse towards the girls. Whew. We're selling the family farm and he is living in the family home currently. He does not speak to the girls at all because he feels like they need to apologize to him about CPS getting involved. <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake. Cry me a river. After the farm sells, we split proceeds and move forward with a divorce. He will not get his own attorney. He wants to just go to my attorney. Mm, that's a conflict of interest. Your attorney can't do that. He wants to move 2,200 miles away after the farm sells. How can I keep him from doing this until the divorce is final and child support is finalized? 
Um, I don't know that you can keep him um, from moving. Again, this is a legal question. I would put all of this to your attorney. I am not an attorney. Um, I would put all of this to your attorney. I would say that, first of all, your attorney cannot be his attorney. And your attorney can't even be your mediator if you were going to mediate because they were already your attorney. So that would be a conflict of interest. Your attorney is your attorney. Your attorney cannot work for both parties. Doesn't work that way. So that's nice that he wants to go to your attorney. That's just not how the law works. And he'll find that out the minute he calls your attorney. After the farm sells, he wants to move 2,200 miles away. How can I keep him from, um, you know, I don't th- I don't know that you can keep him from moving you know, he's still going to be on the hook for um, child support, whether he lives there or not. So but again, I think you need to talk to your attorney about this. What if my relationship is dead, but the idea of leaving my home, my extended family and my life is the terrifying part? Great question, Liz. This is a very, uh, it's a very common question. And actually, you'll find it asked in the group a million times. But your extended family, there's grief, right? Even if you are so fucking excited to leave, you know, your marriage, like it feels like freedom, um, there will still be grief. And a lot of that grief is very often around, you know, your home, your extended family, right? Everything that you have known. It is very real that that fear is very real. You could do some journaling exercises on like what you're actually afraid of, right? So I would like do that thing where you take it even further, like, and then what? And then what? And then what? right? To really get down into like the real, like what's really going on. So like, why are you so scared of leaving your home? Fighting to keep your marital home is one of the biggest financial mistakes that women make when they're getting divorced. Um, And, you know, you you may not have to leave it, but, um, you know, holding on to something that you can't afford on your own is a, is a big mistake, um, especially long term, right? You may be able to afford it like, you know, for the first couple of years, but long term, it's a it's dangerous. So um, I uh, so, you know, I want you to I want you to think about, you know, we have this we have this connection and this attachment to our homes, especially as women. So many of us are like the ones that put everything into it. We put everything into these homes. We're like we love them. Listen, to this day, I do not drive down the street where my old house was. I left that house 14 years ago. And to this day, almost like 13 and a half years ago, to this day, I very often will take like the long cut so I don't have to drive past my old house because I still miss it that much. And my ex doesn't even live there anymore. Like he sold it. Like, you know, it's not even in our family anymore. I miss that house so much. And Keeping it would have been a financial disaster for me. I got a fresh start and I, you know, I, I got to build something new for myself. And this is a time of building something new. Um, in terms of your family, your extended family, it's really hard, right? You are going to miss them. There is a, and listen, it's not forever, right? It depends on how things go, right? Depends on who they are. My, my in-laws, for the first couple of years, of course, they needed there to be a bad guy and it had to be me. But now... My mother-in-law, my my father-in-law passed away, but before he passed away, we were very, very close. Um, And my mother-in-law and I are incredibly close. When she comes to town, she and I go out to dinner, just the two of us, and we, you know, gossip and and talk and laugh, and we have the best time together. It wasn't like that for the first couple of years. So I just want you, um, I just want you to know that, first of all, when grieve what there is to grieve, very important, grieve what there is to grieve know that it won't always be this way, right? There is, there is, I wouldn't say an end to any of this. There's never an end, but there, you know, there, there's change. It won't always be like this. You know, if you've been a stay at home mom at a certain point, you're going to have a job, you're going to have your own, you know, you'll have a new home that you love that you make as a home. Um, Your kids, like where I always say this about you, about you moms too, especially stay at home moms, wherever we go, is home. And this is what my ex-husband said to me, and he was absolutely right. He said, Kate, wherever you go is home to him. And he was completely right. I didn't need to keep um, uh, the house in order to keep my son's life consistent. Actually, my my ex did because, you know, he was the one who was sort of coming and going. But anyway, I digress. But grieve what there is to grieve and know that 
you know, the grief does not last forever. Jessica, pros and cons of hiring a parenting consultant. I don't know of any cons except that, you know, they cost money. Um, I think that if you get a really good one, the, they help immeasurably. Um, and, you know, it's like there's a lot of, you know, co-parenting stuff that very often we're, we're taking the lead on because we're the ones who've read all the parenting books and we're the ones who are like in, in groups like this that don't really exist for men. They, you know, very often haven't read any parenting books, blah, 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 blah. Right. And so it really helps rather than for us to be like, well, but it's, you know, this is what's best because the first thing they're going to do is be like, well, fuck you. No. Um, and so, a parenting consultant will a co-parenting consultant will help you at least, you know, be the they'll be the they'll be the person to say, you know, the quote neutral third party to say what's best and you don't have to. So I think I, I don't know about any cons other than, you know, the expense. Chris, recommendations to help choose an attorney. Um, you know, I think it's in the guides or it's in my free resources that there's a tab for in my on my website. Um, that there is a great article with like questions, like the top 50 questions to ask. And, um, some of them are really good questions. And what I say though, is first of all, go with your gut, listen to your inner voice as you're sitting there listening to this, um, attorney, you want to feel nurtured and taken care of. You need to feel nurtured and taken care of. Um, by your attorney. And so often you, um, you don't. And so often the same part of us that chose our, our spouse is choosing the attorney. And I've had a number of clients who have had attorneys and I'm like, this person is a, your attorney's abusing you. <laughs> like they're dismissing you. They're dismissing what you, um, your concerns. They're not getting back to you. They're being aggressive. They're do, they're exhibiting power over. And so I really think that, um, you, uh, you need to make sure that, that you're not hiring, um, another abuser. And so, you can fire your attorney at any time. Um, and if you and if you are with a, with an attorney who is not serving your needs and is not have your needs, um, you know, your interests at heart and you don't feel taken care of, um, I would I would choose another attorney. So there's like the logistics of choosing the attorney and then there's like the emotional part of choosing an attorney. And I and I think that it would be very um, important to listen to the emotional part, too. Callie, what advice would you give if you suspect your co-parent is sharing your conversations with their new partner? I don't feel safe communicating anymore or making efforts at a better relationship now. Oh, I'm sure they're sharing their conversations with their new partner. Always. Of course they are. <laughs> of course. And it's there's nothing you can do about that, right? They have this new person in their corner who's like, yeah, that's dumb or like whatever. And if this person also isn't – listen, I've dated people <laughs> – who are divorced and being me, of course, you know, they'll share stuff with me and I'm like, yeah, they're right. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know. But for the most part, that's not the kind of partner um, that they have. They're going to have a partner who's, you know, blowing smoke up their ass and like, yeah, you're right. And nah, nah, nah. you have to communicate with your co-parent. You have to. They're going to share it with somebody else. And, and they may even come back to you and say things like, you know, well, so-and-so, I showed, I showed this to so-and-so and she says, blah, blah, blah. And at which point you just say, I am co-parenting with you. I'm not co-parenting with your new partner. And so that's not relevant to this conversation. My ex would do that to me all the time about, about his new wife. He'd be like, well, you know, Mary Jo, let's say, just for her own privacy. Um, Mary Jo thinks that, you know, you're being really unreasonable. And Mary Jo thinks that that you shouldn't do this and thinks that you're, you know, too coddling. And she thinks, and I'm like, and I would just have to be like, yeah, I'm not co-parenting with Mary Jo. I'm co-parenting with you. We would also um, say things like, uh, he would say things to me about how, oh God, what would he say? He'd be like, oh, well, Mary Jo and I have decided um, that the kids aren't getting phones until, you know, they're, you know, this age. And I'm like, you and Mary Jo can discuss that about like your kid, but you and I make these decisions about our kid. You and Mary Jo don't make 
unilateral decisions about my kid, <laughs> right? And so my po- point being, you have to continue to have a co-parenting relationship with your ex and who he shares it with and what how he brings that back to your, and you just keep repeating, uh, I'm not interested in what so-and-so has to say. I'm, I'm interested in, the, in co-parenting. I'm co-parenting with you. You have to, you don't feel safe communicating anymore or making efforts at a better relationship. You have to. You have to. You have to communicate. This is about your kid. These hurt feelings have to get put aside. Look, it's terrible when you feel like people are talking about you behind your back. Believe me, when you get divorced, people are talking about you behind your back. And you've got to get some really thick skin about that. It's just the way it is. And I'm sorry. It sucks. Your self-confidence has to be so strong that it doesn't fucking matter. I don't fucking care what Mary Jo thinks of my parenting. Of course, she's judging my parenting. Whatever. Right? Fine. You know, I judge hers sometimes, too. That's just the way it is. At the end of the day, the person that I am communicating with and I am co-parenting with is my is, is my co-parent. And I have to do that. So, Jessica, I'm sorry you said, Callie, I'm sorry I would stop communicating with him full stop. Why? No. 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 You have children. You have children. If you don't have children, then who fucking cares? Like, forget it. But if you have children, you can't stop communicating with your co-parent. Absolutely not. Um, Daniela, do you have any groups at all or resources I could recommend to my ex on co-parenting. I know there aren't a ton of resources out there for men with divorce, but would love to know if there's anything out there I could just recommend. Yes, absolutely. This book, Parenting Apart uh, by Christina McGee. Christina McGee has been on my podcast a number of times. And this is the best resource. Follow Christina on Instagram. Uh, she does all sorts of stuff. She teaches classes on co-parenting. Um, she trains co-parenting um, uh, specialists. I'm certified by her as a co-parenting specialist. Uh, she works with clients directly, uh, one-on-one. So, yes, uh, and anything and everything to do with uh, Christina that Christina McGee puts out. Uh, that's my that's my best resource. L, how to deal with your hurt and anger when he moves on first and very quickly involves the new partner in your young children's lives and won't agree on boundaries? <laughs> yeah. Well, those are two, I think there's two separate things here. How to deal with your hurt and anger when he moves on first and very uh, very quickly involves his partner. So listen, um, first of all, they all move on very quickly because men, uh, if, 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 this, if your partner um, is a man, uh, your former partner is a man, um, they move on very quickly because men cannot be alone. Men do not know how to be alone. Plain and simple. Sorry. Um, and so they move on very quickly. And, you you know, I, I talk about this a lot. Like, think about all the labor that you did. They got to replace that. They're not going to fucking pick up the slack. They have to replace that. So that's why... They move on very quickly. And that's also why they involve the new partner in the young children's lives so quickly because they can't fucking parent without another partner. They can't do it. And because there's a fantasy and all of that stuff. And so, listen, your hurt and anger about it is righteous. It is it is completely normal. It is 100 percent valid. You know, you just deal with it by being with it. I, you know, I hate, I hate it, right? Like you just have to be with it and you got to go through it and you got to move through it and you got to feel it all. But just know it's not about you. It is not personal. It is about their inability to function without a woman picking up all that slack. As for not agreeing on boundaries, I don't know what boundaries you're referring to. Um, So this is one of those things that should be in your co-parenting agreement, Um, and you, you know, it's hard when you're like separated and you don't have, you don't have an agreement in place yet. And they're already introducing the kids. Right. So I would do that should be something that you guys agree on, like as soon as possible, new partners should not meet the children until the children have had sufficient time to process the divorce. What that means is I have a I have a, a client a woman in the group. She her 
Uh, she and her husband decided that they, you know, were separating in like May or something or March, I think. But they didn't tell the t- kids until June and they didn't move out until June. And by September, he was introducing the new partner. And he's like, well, we've been separated since March. And, you know, I was like, but the children didn't know until June. So you've given them three months. He's like, well, I gave him six. I gave it six months. And it's like, no, 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 you didn't. You didn't give the children. You gave the separation six months. We didn't give the children six months. So you want to, my recommendation is that the kids should probably have a good nine months, six to nine months of just adjusting to life in two homes and with two parents. Each of you needs to be figuring out just how to be a parent and 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 leaning into the relationship with your kids before bringing new people into the, into the mix. You have to solidify your new normal with your kids before bringing new people in. That is my, you know, and so it's not a timeline of the relationship. It's a timeline for the kids. And so, you know, you want to agree to that and have that in your co-parenting agreement, like quickly, right? Because you're going to separate, they're going to date, and then they're immediately going to, you know, uh, find somebody, you know, before you've you know, introduced them, before you've even had a chance to have a mediation. So, you know, it's a tough one. Oh, honey, yes. I don't know how to say your name, Persiana or Perjana. I just need to hear that the kids will be all right. Sweetheart, the kids will be all right. The kids will be all right, even if your ex is still a motherfucker, is still abusive, is still awful. If you are doing your work and you are, you know, reading the the, the books and doing the work, your kids will be all right. They only need one. Of course, it's ideal for them to have two parents who, you know, who are doing the work and are showing up and all of that. But even if it's just one. Even if it's just you, because you can't control what the other par- what the other parent's going to do. Even if it's just you, they will be all right. As long as you are giving them a safe, nurturing place to land. If you are, you know, being their best advocate and their best caretaker and all of those things, they will be all right. Carrie, how do you recommend dealing with someone who always plays the victim? I.e., you're right. I'm sure it's all my fault. I don't want to live It's gonna if it's going to be like this. Oh, give me a break. Um, I recommend that you look up um, the MEND project has their terms and conditions. This is a form of abuse. Um, playing the victim is a form um, of abuse because it it's a form of stonewalling. It's shutting down the conversation like, like if you're like, hey, we have a problem and they're like, you're right. It's all my fault. OK, OK. Then they shut down communication. Um, and, and so now like, there's nowhere to go, um, how you deal with that. And I don't know if this is, if you're still married or you're divorced, but, um, if you're still married to them, I would say you, if there isn't sort of more, uh, if there aren't more, um, signs of abuse happening, although that's very rare, um, you might take that to therapy and be like, I can't communicate with you if you do this and have the therapist work on that. Um, otherwise you just say, um, what you're doing is stonewalling and you're shutting down the conversation. If you would like to have a conversation about how to make things better, I'm all ears. But if you're just going to play the victim, then I can't have this conversation with you and I'm done. That's it. Because you can't. And I would not don't I would not take any of the bait. Do not take the bait. Do not get involved. Don't like just be like, OK, OK, fine. You know what? Bye. Um. If you'd like to have a conversation with me, let me know. But if you're just going to play the victim, uh, there's nothing I, there's nothing for me to, to talk about. Um, <clears throat> Daniela, I there are times I feel eh, wait, there are times I feel like I'm co-parenting with my ex mother in law, <laughs> and my ex seems to think she can do that, and is him by proxy or something. Any tips? Yeah, don't co-parent with your mother in law. Literally, just say. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not co-parenting with you. Please, I need to talk to my ex or say to your ex, I'm not co-parenting with with my mother-in-law. Unless it's like around logistics and like pick up and drop off and she's the one doing it. But I really want you to think about your own personal power here, right? You can say no. You can just say, no, I'm not having this conversation with you. Um, I will discuss it 
um, with my ex when he's ready to talk. I started the process six months ago, but have halted everything because of his reaction when I told him, <laughs> yelling and crying and carrying on, go tell the kids what you want to do now. Now I'm afraid of pursuing further because of his reaction and traumatizing the kids. Okay, so Amber, in the guides, I have, I think it's like a how he's going to react. In my program, the Divorce Survival Program, I have a whole, I have like a bunch of modules on this about how to have the conversation and then how he's going to react. This is one of the ways he's going to react and then how you deal with that. I also have it in a blog post in, it's just in the guides. It's all in there. Um, please go find those. Um, I think I also have podcast episodes about it, but I think they're all linked in the guides, but thoughts on how to navigate through a legitimate fear of your soon to be ex's new partner being around your children due to the toxicity of their relationship, high highs and low lows akin to addiction. So they're trauma bonded, her very frequent suicidal episodes, her being fresh out of rehab for drugs and alcohol and oh, Jesus Christ. I know the courts can only deal with the two people that were in the marriage and I cannot control who he's with, but there is legitimate fear, which is heard if I play nice, just unsure in how I ever gain trust if they're not with me. Well, listen, if they're in the house together, if they're cohabitating, then the courts actually can do it because it is about the home, the safety of the home. And so I would talk to an attorney about this. Again, the courts really don't understand domestic violence. They don't understand the lack of safety for children. It takes so much to have a child removed from a home uh, of one of the partners, even if it's really fucking dangerous. So um, it depends on your state. It depends on your county. It depends on your attorney. I'm sure it depends on a lot of things. I would love to, I would like for you to circle back, Jenny, talk to your attorney. And if you would post in the group and tag me, I want to know what they say about this because this is a really serious issue. But if they're living together, I mean, even if they're not living together, you can make a request. If you have sufficient evidence, and I want you to run this by your attorney, obviously, but if you have sufficient evidence of her toxicity and and general your legitimate safety for your uh, fear of safety for your kids you might be able to bring that to a judge and that she may not be allowed around them so uh yeah i would i would i would for sure bring that as as firmly as you can to your um to your attorney and then circle back i want to know i want to know what they say uh, hello, Kate. Please share more about grit and grace. Oh, yay. And more specifically, how the women in the container are finding it. Oh, my God. They love it. <laughs> I love them for loving it so much. I wish I had on hand um, all of my the testimonials from them. But God, it's so great, you guys. And I, I want you all to come and join it. Oh, my God. Please come and join grit and grace. It's so great. You know, we have calls three weeks a month. They're, they're sort of like this, except that we're on Zoom together and we're um, um, on video. And so we have conversations and people bring their stuff and I coach people and everybody always feels like they get, I, don't, I haven't, haven't heard from anyone who feels like they haven't gotten enough attention. It's a, so Grit and Grace is my group program. I want to tell you about sort of all the stuff that I have for you guys, because look, I feel like I have so much... I have so much for you guys, and I love you for showing up here. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir because you're actually here. You're some of the people that are actually, um, you know, um, showing up and 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 really want to learn, right? And so that's amazing. My programs, I've got Should I Stay or Should I Go, which is, I, I think I've said enough about Should I Stay or Should I Go. It's really the healing process. If you want to do any of the healing involved this is, I mean, really, um, this is, you know, should I stay or should I go is, is, is part of that. I have the divorce survival program, which is like, I'm getting divorced. What now? Um, you know, how do I have the conversation? What's a mediator? What do I need to do? Right? Like the, like the, the, the divorce 101, essentially I have tackling codependence. I want you all to do tackling codependence. You guys, it's like, it's really affordable. I mean, look, I get it. Some For some, it's really not, but um, it's really affordable. All of my programs, I try to keep as accessible as possible. Tackling Codependence is an amazing program. Um, it's based on the book by Pia Melody, Facing Codependence, which is an amazing book. Grit and Grace is my group program. And it is like, ugh, the women are loving it. The women are really loving it. They're getting so much out of it. And like I said, like in Grit and Grace, it's 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 a, it's a sm an intimate program. And if there are a lot more participants, I'm going to open up a second cohort so that we, you know, I can we can keep that intimacy. I don't want it to get too big. You know, so I've been doing I give them challenges. I pair them up 
like accountability. Okay. Who is going to, you know, get on the phone with so-and-so this week and like help make sure that she gets through this process. When there are people who have really similar issues, I've paired them up to be like, you guys are dealing with a really similar thing. I want you in contact with each other. In Grit and Grace, you get access to all of my programs. You get the divorce survival program. You get, should I stay or should I go? Um, you get tackling codependence. You get an intake session with me, a 60 minute intake in which I will go through like very specifically, you know, your whole story, your history, your, um, your, you know, your childhood, um, family history and all of that. And then I make, and then I give you what's called a personalized program map. And I give you all of the recommendations for all like, and then I, then I give you a document that has like my analysis of our call, what I think you need to do, what your goals are, how we can achieve those goals. Honestly, guys, you know, I, when I, I, when I create programs, I never fucking know, right? I really don't know. I'm like, I, I think this is great. <laughs> and then sometimes they just like, eh, you know, um, this one is, is a, uh, is knocking it out of the park. I think this is what women want. Listen, the community part of it is what the women are saying is that the community aspect of it, um, is like everything that they need. They just need to know that they're not alone. That part of it is just extraordinary. That program, you'll find it on my website, kateanthony.com, right across the navigation says grit and grace. So go, go there and read about it. You can sign up for a consultation. I only, I have consultations for that and for my private coaching because we want to make sure that it's the right fit. Should I stay or should I go is an online program. It is, it is self-paced. You do the work. You get access to a much smaller, more intimate Facebook group. That's like my client only group. And so there's a lot more conversation in there that is sort of on the level of people who have been doing this work, who, who have like really been engaging in my work. And then you get the monthly community calls, which again, I did as sort of like a, yeah, sure, let's do a community call. And it turns it to, out to be like one of the most favorite thing. Um, people love the community calls. It's really sort of one of the things that people love the most. And so it's great. I love them too. Um, we do them every month. They're an hour long. We get on Zoom. People um, people ask questions. I answer them, <laughs> obviously. Um, and again, there's community built there. So, so I would listen. You guys, you showed up here. You're doing this work. You're really curious and you are interested in deepening your learning. And I want you to take advantage of the programs that I have created for you. Because I really, I, I created them for you. And sure, it's it's my business and all of that. And like, you know, when I pitch my shit to you, it's because like, you know, sure, it's my business. But more than anything in this world, I want you guys doing this work because I want you to experience what's available on the other side, where there's that clarity, there's confidence, there's like that steadfastness within yourself that you fucking know who you are, right? Like some of these questions that I was answering and I was like, you just say no, right? You just say no, <laughs> right? And people are like, I what? <laughs> um, that's it, right? It's that steadfastness, that clarity, that confidence. You need it to move through this. You cannot move through divorce in the same mindset that you've been in your marriage when you've been so destroyed by a person, um, especially if you've been abused, when you've just been so destroyed and downtrodden, right? And you're still feeling like you're second guessing yourself, as somebody said, like, just, I don't, I don't know who I am anymore. And I don't, and how do I get past, like, still second guessing everything? You got to do this work. You've got to do this work. Otherwise, you're going to get steamrolled and railroaded in a divorce or the next relationship. Listen, I say it all the time. I'm going to repeat it again. 50% of first marriages end in divorce, 68% of second marriages end in divorce, and 74% of third marriages end in divorce because people don't do this work. I created this for you, please. But for the love of all that's holy, take advantage of what I create for you uh, because it's um, I literally create it for you. I really do. And I am so grateful to all of you for showing up today. Thank you for those who have stayed. And I, it's been... Um, but I really appreciate it. Listen, my programs are on my website, kateanthony.com. I love you guys so much. Thank you so much for being here. And yeah, maybe we'll do this again sometime. It was fun. I appreciate you guys for showing up. You're awesome. 
I adore you. Happy holidays. Happy, happy holidays, everybody. Seriously, try to have some fun. Try to enjoy yourselves. Enjoy your kiddos. And um, bye. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. If you like what you hear, head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in and leave me a review. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at the Divorce Survival Guide. I'll see you next time. And until then, remember, you, my love, deserve to be happy.